Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. My name is Weekend Modder, and I am here with an updated 2018 guide on how to JTAG slash RGH your fat Xbox 360 for just $24 in total parts cost. This will give you an RGH 1.2 insta booting. Uh, console that's capable of running mod menus, connecting to stealth services, and running emulators. All sorts of other good stuff as well. So first thing I want to show you here is just the real basic run through of the equipment that we're going to use to do this. So we're going to use a JR Programmer V2. This is going to be the device that allows us to interact with the console. We're going to use a glitch chip that goes by the name of the Matrix V1. This little guy uh, will be what actually performs part of the modification for us. And then some basic general supplies that I'm not calculating into the cost are going to be a fiberglass scratch pin, some flux paste, and a soldering iron. Those items you can find some recommendations about down below in the uh, video comments. So hang out with us and we'll walk through it. All right, so as far as software goes, we just did a high level overview of the hardware. I wanna show you that we're going to be using the JRunner application to do this modifying. And uh, I wanna cover all the bases here. So the first question is, well, where do I get JRunner from? So here, if we take a look at a normal Google search, if you just do weekend modder JRunner download, you can see this first video link is actually a link to a video on my channel that has the JRunner and extras download. And if you go ahead and hit this mega link here, it'll bring you to a big giant 271 megabyte download. You'll go ahead and grab that package, unzip it, and then when you uh, open that up, you'll have the JRunner application. Go ahead and fire that bad boy up with a right click run as administrator. And as you can see, I've already done that. I've got JRunner started right here. Another thing that you might need to uh, have some visibility into is the JR Programmer and its drivers. Now I'm gonna make a separate video that specifically talks about its drivers. I'm gonna show you on store.weekendmodder.com because I do sell these uh, JR programmers. You can pick one up from me for just 20 bucks. Uh, you can see that the download for the drivers is right there. Weekendmodder.com slash JRPV2 underscore drivers dot zip. You can grab that package here, which has a handy dandy installer that talks about all the funky ways that you might need to disable driver signature enforcement and a whole bunch of good screenshots and stuff. Separate video that I'll link uh, to this one uh, once that's produced. And then the other thing is the matrix glitcher V1. Now again, store.weekendmodder.com, you can find one of these, uh, the matrix glitcher. And if you need the timing files that I'm gonna show you to use, you can find those right here. Today we're gonna be using the RGH 1.2 timing files, and you can find those for download right there on my website. So now that you know where to get all of the supplies, all of the equipment that you'll need, you can check out the video description for recommendations on that flux space and the scratch pin we can go ahead and actually get started. So step number one uh, is going to be that we need to read the NAND of this console. The reason that we do that is we need a backup in case anything goes screwy. We need to have the original backup NAND. Now, the way that we'll do that is by reading from these pin headers right here and here. And let's get in for a little closer look. All right, so you can see that there's a whole series of little dot guys here and over here. That's the two spots that we're going to solder to in order to read this NAND. And I want to show you where you can get a reference image for that. In the JRunner package that I mentioned before is all of the built-in images. If you download that and use the software, you'll be able to do exactly what I'm doing here. So you just hit images drop down. You go to Nandex fat install. And uh, this popped up on my other monitor, so I'm just going to drag it up for you. You can see, um, as soon as I resize this guy, uncheck this zoom, and you can see that we've got a nice reference image here that lays out the color coding and the numbering of the dots that we're going to be soldering to on those two headers. Now, um, these are corresponding to the cable that comes with your JR programmer. 
So if we look at the JR programmer, it comes with a set of wires that plugs into it that's color coded to match exactly what was on that diagram. So if you're confused about how I'm knowing what goes where with the part that I'm working on right now, just check, check, check that reference image and just match up the color coding to that. Now mine is a little uh, funky because I've got some electrical tape on it and stuff just to reinforce it, but uh, yours will be exactly the same. And that actually plugs in just right there on the JR programmer uh, later when we go ahead and use this thing. So the reason that we mentioned the fiberglass scratch pin before, and I want you guys to get a good look at this, as you can see, see how these points look kind of dull and they're, uh, they're not shiny at all. They've, they've actually got a little bit of a coating over the top of them. So what I'm going to do here real quick is actually use this fiberglass scratch pin to run that coating off. And I'm not going to scratch real hard or for real long, but what you should notice is a visible difference in, you see how those things look real shiny and nice now? That's going to allow the solder to stick to them and us to do a much better job here. If you compare that to this header up here, see how if we can get those both in the same shot? This one looks way shinier than this does right now. Well, we'll do the same thing to this upper header here real quick. And I apologize, I know my camera goes in and out of focus pretty pretty frequently. There's nothing I can really do about it as far as I know. Alright, so now that one's looking nice and shiny here as well. So this is where the flux paste that we talked about before. This is uh, just a vial of Amtec flux paste. I picked this stuff off of eBay. Again, check the video description down below. There'll be uh, links to this sort of stuff. So what you'll want to do is just put a nice glob right over the top. And I'm not hitting it with the end of my point. I definitely don't want to scratch anything up. But I'm just putting a nice glob of flux paste down there and then here as well. Now, um, for a lot of folks, I might would recommend that you leave the console inside the case at this point, but for navigation of the, uh, of the camera around here, I'm gonna go ahead and remove my fan and pop this, I gotta remove the front ring of light board. I'm going to take this motherboard out of the case so I can get you guys close-up views with the camera but still have a little bit of room to work um, for myself here. So, let's see about getting this guy to focus. There we go, that looks pretty good. All right, so I'm gonna fire up my soldering iron. I run a Hacko FX888D. That's the, the soldering iron of my choice. That's about a $100 soldering iron. So definitely don't expect that everybody would need to pick up anything like that. A 15 watt soldering iron should do you. Something that can obtain something about 350, 400 degrees Celsius. I run a little bit hotter than that. I do about 470 and you'll notice that my work is pretty quick when I hit these spots. With the exception of the ground point, which you may need to put some uh, additional time on because it, it soaks up the heat as it spreads across the ground plane. So uh, again, referencing back real quick to the uh, reference here, we can see this is the uh, header that we're looking at and we've got black, brown, red, orange, and yellow that all go down here. And then we've got the green and blue wires that go up here. So what you're gonna watch me do is just soldering these connections exactly like that. And, and uh, not to be snobby or anything, but pay attention to technique. Technique is key. I can't tell you how many motherboards I've seen killed uh, by not doing this properly here. So um, we've got our flux paste. We'll go ahead and hit that with a soldering iron, just kind of spread it out a little bit, kind of melt it. And what I'm going to do is place a little ball of soldering iron on top of each pad. And that is uh, colloquially known as tinning the pad. So by doing this later, we're going to make our job a whole lot easier. So I'm holding the iron down. I'm getting a little glob of solder on top of each one. And then this last one, 0.5, the yellow point, this is actually a ground. So it's not uncommon to need to hold the heat on there for a little bit longer than the other points. So those are there. And then we'll come up to this top one. Go ahead and 
uh, hit the two points that we need here as well. So those are the green and blue uh, wires that we're going to do. Now I've grabbed my, uh, my wire set that comes with the JR programmer and uh, we're just going to start in order with that black wire. That's going to go to the bottom left as it is. I just want to make sure you guys can still see that past my sausage fingers. And so the technique is, as it is, is I'm going to press the side of my iron into that little ball of solder. And then as it's molten, I'm going to insert the wire into that ball of solder. And the, the little bit of solder that's on the end of here will kind of wick to it. And uh, that'll be that. So here we go. Touching it to solder wicks to. And that's how you end up with a nice, clean connection that's plenty firm and strong. And so I'm just gonna pull out my next wire, which is the brown one. And then same process, I'm gonna hit the side of the iron to the ball, shove the wire in there, and then pull the iron off to allow all the solder to cool. Now red uh, is gonna go in the three point. This one, uh, I come in at from the side here. So you can see how I'm holding the wire off to the side and I'm just getting it so that those two uh, points can be real close to each other. There we go. All right, and now the orange, similarly come in from the other side. You can notice there's kind of a little hook bent in my wire here. So if you can take your wire and bend that little hook into it, what you can do is hold it from one side with your non-dominant hand and then hit it with the iron and allow that point to melt together just like you want it to. And then uh, same process with the very last one in that spot, the yellow wire. Um, it's got a little hook built into it for the same reason. So we'll come at it from that side. I'll hit it with the iron here. And again, you have to hold a little bit more heat on the uh, the yellow wire because that is a ground. And you can see that we've got that connected. Now there's an excessive amount of solder on each of these as long as they are not touching. As long as there's no bridges, you got no issue here. You're relatively safe. Even if there is a bridge here and you fire up the console because you thought it wasn't bridged, it's probably not going to ruin it. So don't panic too much here. Now we want to go ahead and get those uh, blue and green wires. So uh, the green wire number six uh, goes on top per our diagram. So we'll just hit that as well. So there's six. And then the blue wire uh, comes down from the bottom or goes to the, the lower spot. And we'll just get that one in place as well. All right, so now we have installed our NAND header uh, and we are ready to take the NAND dumps or backup copies of the NAND image. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slide the motherboard over here and you notice that I've got a power cable just hanging out. Now it's important here that you supply standby power to the console but you don't actually turn it on. So I don't even have the ring of light board plugged in into the front which is where the power switch is. Um, you don't need it at this point. So got our JR programmer and we'll go ahead and plug that guy in a couple of things about the JR programmer real quick okay so quick message about the JR programmer it has two functions right we can do a XSVF programming which is uh, through this connector this is how we program the glitch chip and then it has the NAND read write functionality and you have to switch modes between it. I recommend switching the modes only when the thing's unplugged but this switch is what pushes it in either direction so when it's to the left that is in NAND read write mode and this port is active that's what we're going to be using right now when it's to the right when you move that switch to the right, then the XSVF or the chip programming option is uh, enabled. So we're going to leave this switch to the left. And then just for anybody else that's curious, this switch down here is to put the thing in bootloader mode or not. And that's in case you ever need to reprogram the JR programmer. Occasionally they get a little flaky, they lose their programming, and you have to reflash them with their own code. And the way you do that is you, you toggle this bootloader switch here. So for our purposes right now, 
this switch needs to be to the left and uh, we'll go ahead and see that we have standby power connected to our console we'll go ahead and plug in the um, JR programmer and I have this little piece of cardboard under here because the JR programmer has exposed points on the back here and we don't want those to ground out against anything metal we'll go ahead and plug in our NAND header that we wired up right and then we can just set that here to the side and pop up into JRunner. So if we go into JRunner, this is the, uh, the the points that we just installed to. What we can do here is just go ahead and click this question mark button. And what that's going to do for us is it's going to do a it's going to perform a query when we hit this little question mark button, and it will double check that the console has a valid flash config and that you see something that makes sense here about what type of console you have. Now this exact process would be applicable to any Falcon or any Jasper, but there are some variants. Some consoles are going to be 16 megabytes, some are going to be 256, and some are going to be this big 512. What this really means for us is when we take the NAND dump, it's going to take a really long time to complete, but we are good. We did see valid results here. Now up here, I demonstrated just so that we could see what not valid results would look like. If you hit this query and you got something like this, flash config 000, what you might want to consider is do you have standby power plugged in? Is your JR programmer switches in the correct orientation? Um, so once you get a good result here, you're good to go. You want to have two reads of the NAND because you want at least two matching copies to ensure that you got a good read. And we'll just go ahead and click this read NAND button. This thing will begin. It, it does prompt us for a confirmation. Um, I generally don't make any changes here. We just say OK. And uh, it's beginning to read the NAND here. And this is significantly slower than a NANDX would be able to do this. So uh, I'm going to fast forward through this section uh, as this completes. And then we'll talk about it at the end. All right, I'm gonna slow it down here right as we're nearing the finishing line of the second NAND read. I wanna point out something real quick. Notice this error reading block AA0. The reason this is important is you may see one or multiple of these. Anywhere up to like 10 or 15 is probably pretty normal. If they have varying blocks, whatever. What you wanna see is consistency. So here we have an error reading that block. Here we also have an error reading that block and notice it's the only one in both cases. So ultimately what you're gonna see is that as this finishes, it's gonna do a comparison between the first copy of the NAND that it uh, downloaded, the NAND dump one file, and then it's gonna do a comparison to this NAND dump two file. And what we hope to see at the end here is a NANDs are the same message, indicating that the first copy ex excuse me, exactly matches the second copy and that they are identical. By doing that, we have we will have then confirmed that the, uh, the, the copies we have are, are good and could be rewritten back to the console and result in a functional console. So here we go. That's exactly what we wanted to see here. We've got the uh, comparing and then NANDs are the same, the ever important message here. So again, it's okay to have bad blocks reading NANDs. If you see a bad block indicated here, you may even get a message in here that says something about bad blocks remapped. If you see that, again, totally normal, totally acceptable, we're good to go. So uh, what do we do with the console at this point? Um, so we've got standby power still hooked up. We've got the JR programmer. We can actually disconnect both of those things. So we can disconnect our JR programmer. We can disconnect our standby power. And uh, we'll continue on our way of installing the glitch chip and getting this console ready. So. Next step, after we have taken our valid, good NAND backups, is we're ready to start installing our glitch chip. All right, so what do we do? How do we know where all these pads are going to get soldered to, where the other end of the wires are going to go, what we need to do to set this up? I want to point you at the reference material for this. So where we're going to go here is, again, back to store.weekendmodder.com. We're going to pull up that Matrix Glitcher V1. 
because uh, this covers the fat RGH 1.2, which is what we're doing here. So if you just scroll down, this first set of stuff is for slim trinities. That's not what we want. But here we go, fat RGH 1.2. Here's a nice image right here. Looks real similar to what we've got. You can see indicated here that we need to do a little bridge towards the fat side on that little pad here. And then it outlines for us what the names of these points that we're going to be connecting are. Now this same modification can be done with an RGH 1.2, but you'll notice that the, the letter translation is a little bit different. See, on, on the matrix glitcher, A is RST, but that's actually D over here. And there's a whole little translation matrix that I've built for you here. Um, and then we go through and actually identify where the points are on the motherboard. So if you need reference material for what I'm connecting to additional to the video, again, check out the site and we can reference this image right here. So um, pop back over and begin this install. Now, uh, this particular chip didn't come with an adhesive pad, so this is just a piece of double-sided tape that I had laying around. So I'm gonna go ahead and peel that off. And where we're gonna mount this is actually just right on top of this AV shield here. So that's just mounted on with a piece of double-sided tape. And again, per that reference image, what I'm gonna go ahead and do is actually just pre-tin the spots where we're gonna connect wires to. So we saw that first pad here is, uh, needs to be bridged between the fat uh, and the, or, or towards the fat side. So what I've done is just added a whole bunch of extra little solder right there. And then what you can do is just add a little bit more, drag it across and you end up with a nice pretty little bridge there. And then, uh, so the, the areas that we're gonna connect wires to, VCC, that's gonna be our power, G and D, there's your ground, A, that's gonna be your RST line, uh, B, that's going to be your post. C, that's going to be your clock signal. And then finally we do F, which is our PLL signal. Now, notice that there is no crystal oscillator here. If you happen to have picked up a matrix that has one of these crystal oscillators here, that this is populated with a little square doohickey, then you would want to remove this little resistor if you're following this tutorial. We can go ahead and remove it just to prove the point that it doesn't need to be there. But what that does is it disables the connection between this C clock point and the resistor. Now this resi or excuse me, the, uh, the oscillator. There is no oscillator populated on this board, so removing this was unnecessary. Um, but I wanted to demonstrate and call that out for anybody who gets one of these that does have the oscillator. For FAT RGH 1.2, you would need to remove that or just use the one that has no, no oscillator on it. So, first things being first, we're going to want to wire up power here. Now the power that we're going to hit is actually right next to the E and F point, or excuse me, the blue and green points that we did for the the NAND reading. And so it's this top point right here provides a three volt three signal for the VCC. And then actually this bottom one right here uh, on the kind of short side of things, that actually will provide a ground signal for us. So there's our power and there's our ground. Um, you can use pretty much any little bits of wire that you happen to have. Uh, I actually have a little bin full of spare wires and such uh, that I kind of keep around for this purpose. Um, so whatever you got available to you, uh, feel free to make use of. So what I'm going to do real quick is just grab me a little bit of wire. And first things first, we will connect to the power wire. And uh, again, same technique, just kind of melt that solder, stick the end of the wire in there, and then we'll run that up here to the VCC point. I need to strip the end of this wire here real quick. And we'll put that right into the solder that we laid down on that pad, and our power wire is now connected. All right, same story for our ground wire. Um, and you don't have to use uh, black here, but I'm going to, to try to help with uh, consistency for you folks. Also, alternatively, if you don't want to ground to the, the point down here, you can actually just ground off to the chassis. 
So you could put a little solder here and then just run that to the ground point. In fact, maybe I'll demonstrate that. So you saw how this would go, same process to this ground point, but uh, to help maybe with somebody who, who doesn't want to do that one, what I like to do is if I just stick the soldering iron kind of in the pocket of that little tab, you feed some solder in there, you see how it kind of globbed up together. Then you can take the end of a wire, just kind of remelt that so it's nice and stuck to the uh, the AV shield here. And then you can bring that down to the ground point and I'm just gonna snip off that plus a little extra length and uh, trim my wire here. Or rather, strip the end of my wire here. There we go, oh, that still didn't do it. This is not a great stripping technique, but that's what I got available to me at the moment. Now with a thicker wire like this, um, what I like to do is, is actually put a little bit of solder in the wire first, and then when it connects to the ground point, it'll just kind of flow together a little easier. So there's our ground wire grounded up. All right, so now we have our, our actual installation wires to deal with. And the thing that I'm gonna tell you is these first two points that we do, the RST and post A and B, the wire routing is fairly important. Um, the type of wire may or may not be, uh, but what I use is a uh, type of wire that I will include in the description a link to, it's called wrapping wire or Kynar wire. You can get this off of Amazon, it's pretty cheap. It's a really thin single core, it means it's not made of little strands of copper twisted together, but rather it's made of a single strand of continuous metal within there. So as such, it like takes bends and stuff pretty well. But the reason that we wanna use it um, is because I found that it provides really nice boot performance. You might be able to use normal thicker wire, stranded wire, and uh, you may just see a difference in some boot performance here. So the points that we're gonna be soldering to, um, again, to show you the reference material. Um, so we're on this fat RGH 1.2 page, right? So we're going to the post point first. So let's actually do um, the B to the post point. And this is actually, if you see this X clamp thing here, this is on the underside of the motherboard. There's a little row and it's this very last one here. So uh, let's take a look here. As we flip over the motherboard, we can see that the points that it's talking about are actually these right up here. And you can see the last one kind of off by itself. That's where we're gonna go. And we're gonna get there by routing through some little tiny holes down under the X clamp here. So um, let's see if we can get the camera to focus a bit better. There we go. So you see that, that little bitty hole right here just to the side of the X clamp. It's gonna be kind of a pain. But that's what we wanna route through and pop up to the other side of the motherboard. So I'm taking my uh, my length of untrimmed wire still attached to the roll here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put like a little kink in it. So it's kind of, kind of got a little curve to it. And I'm gonna slide it right in here. And then I'm actually gonna use my tweezers to grab and then push down through there. This wire kind of kinks up really easily, so feeding it through with the tweezers is what I found to be the best method. So now I actually need to flip the motherboard back over because what I want to do in order to be the most efficient with my wire is I want to pull enough through here where it popped out so that I can run over to that B post point. And my ultimate wire routing goal is going to be able to come right down here drop straight down, go straight over, follow straight along here, and then allow it to go under. What I really want to avoid is the wire being routed right through this area. Um, I know it sounds silly, but having it routed through that area that I just pointed out actually has resulted in consoles straight up not booting. So this wire routing is relatively important. So the first thing, uh, or so what I'm gonna do real quick, as we'll strip this wire. We're gonna put that, we're gonna melt that B point, put the wire right into there. That was nice and easy. And then we're gonna start with the wire routing. So I'm gonna kind of pull it so that the wire comes straight this way. I'm gonna 
kind of kink it with my finger so that it comes straight down. I'm doing the similar thing down here so that the wire comes straight out. And then what I find uh, works the best is to rotate it so the console is oriented this way in front of me. And what I want to do is pull on just enough through that I have the length that I need in order to run the wire and put a nice corner, a nice 90 degree angle right up near the heat sink. So I've got my nice little corner. I'm kind of holding down away from it because what I'm going to use to hold it in place is actually going to be a small amount of hot glue. So I'm not going to try to go overboard with this. I know I've been criticized in the past for my use of hot glue, but it's a darn useful tool here. So nice little tacky tack with some hot glue right near that corner because then I'm going to reach up on the underside of the board. I'm going to grab that line and then I'm just going to pull through the excess. And now it's nice and tight right up there running right along the heat sink. And that's exactly what we were looking for. So that's the routing that we want to follow. So now as we flip the console back over, bring it back towards us. Now notice that my, my line is still connected to my bobbin uh, full of stuff here. So what I can do is now I can route my wire right up to where it's going to go near that point. And then I'll just trim it with a little bit of extra length. And now I've ended up not using any waste or having any waste on my, my wire routing to that, that point here. And then so um, what I'll do while I got the length nice and exposed is trim off a little bit of the, uh, the wire. And then I'm going to route it under the X clamps here. So we'll poke that guy under here, grab it with the tweezers, pull it through poke it here, grab it with the tweezers, pull it through. So my routing is uh, under both X clamps after it pops up through that little hole, which you can't see from this angle anymore. And then our, our point here again, FT6U1. And uh, what I'll do is put a tiny little dab of flux on there. And we'll do a, a, a tinning like we did with most of the other points. So I'll put a little heat on there, feed some solder in. Now I've, you notice that I've still got kind of a glob of solder on my iron. And then as I hold the wire over that point, oh, sometimes what you need to do is put a little bend in it so that it has kind of downward pressure against the board. And there we go. There it is, a nice little ball of solder. And again, with the hot glue, but what I, what I don't want to have here is I don't want anybody to tug on this and then for that solder joint to be, you know, ripped off and damage the motherboard. So what I do is back from the point, a couple of millimeters, is I just throw a little bit of hot glue over it so that if at any point in the future this gets tugged on, there's gonna be something giving it some additional strength holding that wire into place. But that is the installation of our B post point on this Matrix V1. Now we're gonna repeat the same wire routing top side to the PLL point. The PLL point, um, as we looked at the reference image, and we'll show you that one one more time. So here's PLL, and it, it might be kinda hard to see here, I can zoom in a little bit, is one little guy right here under the X clamp stuff, and it's a tight little spot here. And unfortunately, there's not really a great alternate for it. So you, you got to just man up and do this one. Um, so this is point A um, on a matrix V1. This is F and on a rev C, this is point A. So we're going to do F on the matrix V1 to the PLL again. So if we look here, PLL goes to F and then that is PLL, right? So if we hit our, uh, our camera back here, now there's, you can see there's another hole on this side on the X clamp and our PLL point is up here, right? So we're gonna pop through this hole and then fire our, follow our same 
wire routing that we just did for the other one. So same story, get a little bit of a hook bent in the wire, feed it in there, and then use your tweezers to kind of force feed it further. And get that guy going through there. Okay, so this is, this might be a good, good example. As I fed it through there, there's kind of a kink into the wire, and you see that kind of white coloring. Um, sometimes you have to trim that off and kind of start over. Sometimes you can kind of bend it out with your fingers. Um, I'm trying to not obstruct your guys' view as I do this with the camera. Um, so the technique is a little easier without a camera two inches away from the motherboard. All right, I think we got it that time. Feeding her through. All right, so now as we flip the motherboard over, we see our PLL wire right through there. We can pull a goodly length of it through. And then again, we can strip our end and go ahead and connect it to our F point here. So first things first, a little trim, a little exposed wire. We'll route that right through there so that I can just melt this blob of solder on F, slide the wire in, and there we go. That's connected there. It ended up exposing a little bit more a little bit more uh, wire than is necessary, but it's not contacting anything, so it's not a problem. All right, so same story as before. Our wire routing goal is to exactly follow that first one. So we want to get our corner in up here. So, you know, I, I end up spinning the console around. You got to do what you got to do in order to get the, uh, the angle that works for you. But you put that little bend in the corner right on that same spot. And I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly identical to the other one. There's no advantage to having them uh, perfectly on top of each other. But the, the goal is for them to be, you know, routed the same. I just put a little extra glue down there to hold that one. So we got two little dabs holding those in place. I'm um, just kind of holding it for a second as everything uh, has a moment to cool off and dry. And then again, I'm just reaching up under the console grabbing this underside and then I'm just gonna pull it until it kind of goes taut and runs right there along the edge of the heat sink so that's exactly what we're looking for here all right now this is probably the trickiest point to install on the fat RGH 1.2 so what you want to do is kind of get your wire routing so that you're past that PLL point. Again, the PLL point is that little guy right there. The left one up right above the resistor. Um, and we'll trim it up here. So here we go. Nice little snippy snip right there. And uh, I'm going to back the camera off just a tad here. There we go. So I need to expose some of the end, and here's where it's pretty important. You want as little metal on the end there exposed as possible. So if you can see that clearly, which is going to be difficult, I mean there's just a hair hanging off there. That's actually probably more than is absolutely necessary, um, but we'll, we'll work with it here. Because if you notice, there's there's a pretty minimal gap between here and here, and we don't want to accidentally come off and, and cut anything or, or bridge off of anything. So again, same story, tiny bit of flux right on the point. And when I say tiny, it's it's pretty minuscule amount. And uh, we'll, we'll do the same best practice, which is uh, put a little bit of solder on there. So we'll heat up that area, throw a little solder down. And we want to be careful, you see that blob actually may even be uh, too much because we're, we're, we're approaching bridging off on that other resistor there. Um, so what I'll do is I'll actually use my tweezers to hold this. So I've kind of bent so that it's, it's angled facing downward here. And I'll grab an upper away from the point with the tweezers. 
and I'm just gonna hold it right on that spot so you can see that it's over the top of the thing that I want to connect to there's a little bit of solder on my iron here and I'm just gonna kind of brush it together all right so you can see how we've bridged that resistor that's above it that would actually be totally okay um, this point is connected to that little resistor right there so there's no reason to fix that other than I'm kind of a perfectionist and it looks messy so I'm gonna take that off and redo it there we go so for anybody else especially if you were nervous about this and you did what I did at the beginning which is bridge onto the top of that resistor um, you could have absolutely stopped there what I'm doing now is just kind of flattening that wire pushing it down towards the board because uh, just like with my other point I'm gonna put a little hot glue in there in case this wire ever gets some some pulling on it uh, I don't want that to just get ripped off or anything but man look at that thing that looks pretty now doesn't it let's see if we can get the board to focus again real quick here we go so you can see it's not bridged in either direction there is a little bit more wire exposed here than is necessary but it's not bridged off on anything it's not touching this pad underneath it's it's significantly above it so what I'll do is I'll just come back this way with a, just a squirt of hot glue right in there and I know I'm covering some other stuff. There's nothing under there that's really in any danger. Hot glue can be denatured with just standard rubbing alcohol. So if you need to, you just kind of soak the area in rubbing alcohol for a minute and the hot glue will come right up if you, if you had to. But that'll give it some strength in case anything ever happens there. Now, um, our next point that we'll go ahead and do will be the last one that we run to the back side of the board and that's gonna be our RST. And the RST it, on the matrix actually gets routed to letter pad A. So uh, again, let's show you the reference image here. So we were just right here on PLL. Just across the way, there's an RST point. And again, matrix V1, this is point A. So again, if we reference this image, it says A, R, S, T right here. You could notice that if we were using a rev C, it would be a different letter. So we're gonna go A, R, S, T, right to that guy. And uh, this one, we don't actually route through any holes, so it goes much quicker. So, let's get back in here and uh, show you that little pad, first of all. It's kind of cast in shadow right here, but it's the leftmost pad, that little guy right there. So, we wanna get some flux on it. Just a tiny little bit here. And what I'll do is I'll see if I can get the board to, to stay this orientation. Let's see if I put this under here. Uh, the heat sinks being an uneven height means that, that by their normal, uh, when the console's rested, it, it doesn't want to sit that way. So um, what I'm doing is I'm just taking that same wire that we've been using. I'm just stripping an end piece so that it's got a little tiny bit exposed there and uh, we'll go ahead and tin up that pad and get it ready for connection. So we'll come in with a little bit of solder right to the guy and tin her up. So here we go. So we can see that pad's now nice and shiny, nice little glob of solder on there. Uh, be careful if you come in at a at a steep angle that you don't hit anything else on the board. So we'll just remelt that solder with that wire in there and voila. That's us connected to that RST pad. So similarly, uh, real kind of close up to the point but not on it. I'll give it a little blob of hot glue, not a big deal just a little support and now the wire routing on this one is also relatively important um, 
This you could play with and see if you have various timing files. The, the routing and length of the RST wire uh, can affect boot times, but the method that I'm going to demonstrate for you here, I have uh, done on hundreds of consoles, and I am convinced that it provides a consistent, reliable booting experience across almost every console. Again, Falcon and Jasper that this would apply to. So what you want to do is you want to pull your wire straight along the X clamps here to just to the leftmost X clamp as we're facing it now. And uh, what I'll do is I'll use a little anchor point of hot glue in the same way. So I kind of smear it around to get it where I need it. Um, and that'll take just a second to firm up enough to be holding the wire the way I want it to. You want to be a little bit cautious. These X clamps do get some downward pressure on them from the case. So you don't want the wire to be up under the X clamp there. You want it to be just outside. So sometimes I end up putting a tiny little bit just right there so that they don't end up under the X clamp. Because if that wire gets pinched, it can uh, ground out and then, you know, make things not work. So there's that routed. And then what we're going to do is actually just curve around to this corner. And that's where we're going to pop up to the top side of the motherboard. So I'm just bending, I'm bending this around the corner. And then our last tiny bit of, of glue here is we'll put down. And we don't want it to be a big pile, so I'm using the tip to kind of smear it around. But that's the, uh, the spot where we're going to pop up through. Um, actually, where the fan ends up going is this little cutout is here because the fan sits in there. And that's the RST wire. And uh, from, from this point, we can just go ahead and flip it over. And again, we said RST was going to A. So you can see where that comes up here. I just press it down so it travels along the motherboard, pops up along the chip right the same way that the other wires did. And then it's going to go to A there. So we just trim it off just longer than it needs to be to go to A. Uh, peel the wire off here a little bit. And just go ahead and attach that to pad A. All right, so we've got our RST wire installed now. There is only one pad left to do anything with. That's the one that is not used, and that's going to be C here. Now, C, the wire routing on this one is much less important. It's also not necessary, nor would I even recommend actually using the wrapping wire on that. For whatever reason, I do find that standard stranded wire uh, seems to perform better. This carries a, a little bit of a, uh, a signal that has some power through it. So, um, yeah, there's just an observation here. So, uh, contrary to how we've done all the other ones where we attached it to the pad after the fact, we're actually going to start off with step one here being attaching the wire that we're going to use. And this wire is fairly long. This probably needs to be four or five inches long in total. Um, cause I think I said we were done with the backside of the board, but I lied. There is still one more point on the backside here. So we've attached to C here and, uh, let's take a look at the reference image again, just for, uh, the clock C point. So here we go. So again, uh, C is the CLK, the clock signal. Uh, we're going to go down here to where it points that out, matrix V1, this is point C. This is also on the back side of the motherboard, upside down written, it's FT2R2 is the point where we're going to go on the fat here. So where that is in relationship to the, uh, the console is right on the other side of the south bridge right here. So what we want to do is actually just poke this hole right through that nice easy area, pull it through. And then as far as routing goes, all I end up doing is just kind of holding it to the board. The biggest goal here is just so that it's not in the way of the DVD drive because the DVD drive still sits here. Um, and then I'll usually throw, again, just a tiny bit of hot glue just to hold it in place out of the way. Use electrical tape. 
uh, if you want to, whatever floats your boat, man. Um, don't judge me. <laughs> so flip it over one last time here. We've got our nice wire length, and this is uh, really easy to trace out. You've come out through this hole. FT2R2 is actually right there, so we just run it right up through that point. So again, uh, we'll get in nice and close here for you. Uh, that's the point that we're going to go to. So just past it, we'll trim the wire and strip a little bit off the end here. Ooh, I cut it. Hopefully we had enough extra on there that it'll still be long enough. Um, go ahead and pre-tin the pad, put a little solder on there. Go ahead and pre-tin the wire, put a little solder on the end. And easy peasy, we're actually just gonna put it right on there. So one to one. You know, I'm uh, I'm doing this dry with no flux, which you can do. I have a rosin core, but uh, I don't want to do anything embarrassing here. So we'll we'll reconsider. We'll put a little flux on there. We'll hold this guy down. And there we go. Nice connection. And uh, this is one of those cases where it wants to lift up naturally. So I'm going to hold some downward pressure with my tweezers there, and just kind of more that guy down some so it's connected even though it's off to the side by a bit but the more times you you reheat and play with stuff you're just asking for problems really so it's it's definitely not an issue there and again for a little strength in case it ever gets tugged on tiny bit of hot glue right there and uh that is actually the full install here um we don't have any more uh let's see we don't have any more soldering to do at all at this point so what's left to do, we need to program the glitch chip to tell it how to do its job. Then we need to write the ECC file. So let's do both of those things. Let's flip over the motherboard here. Let's go ahead real quick while we got easy access to this. We've got our JR programmer and this is the cable that comes with it. Now these pin headers, if you get this from somebody else, you're not going to have. So this is just a standard bit 2.54 millimeter pin header that I've just jammed into the uh, header. So this is how it comes uh, and then I've just inserted this bit of pin header so that I don't have to like cut the end of this off and solder to this, but rather I can just stick it right into the holes. Uh, as they line up and uh, make contact that way solderlessly. So our JR programmer, remember how we mentioned this switch needs to be in a different direction per function? So I'm going to go ahead and unplug it for a second. I'm going to move this switch into the XSVF programming or the glitch chip programming method. I'm going to reconnect it and then I'm going to go ahead and plug this guy right here into that port and then I'm even going to go one step further and I'm going to take this pin header bit, I'm going to insert it into these holes, and then I'm just going to hold some pressure on it. So I actually have to hold my chip down a little bit, and then I'm going to hold some kind of side pressure on the chip. What I'm just trying to do is ensuring that I'm, I'm making good contact with all of it here. Now we'll pop up to J Runner, and what we need to do is uh, load up the advanced custom NAND CR function and that brings up this little side sub menu. We need to program a timing file so that's XSVF those are the timing files and then we want to use in this case the RGH1221 file. Now I, I showed you before on that page you can download the timing files they're right in there um, you can navigate that to that package uh, by coming to RGH1.2 you go to the try these, well, actually, let's just go the long way. We go if you mad, which is the full set. Uh, we go the matrix, this one. We go SVF, this one. And you can see there's uh, a 10 all the way up through a 35. I have found almost every console sings with this 21 file, but it may benefit you for doing tuning to go up and down from this point a little bit. So we're gonna go straight for that 21 file. We're going to press run here. We see this uh, XSVF player initiated. It's sending out packets. And then we should eventually here in just a moment get this success message. Now I want to show you what the same thing looks like on the chip itself. 
So real quick, as I'm holding that there, I wanna move my hand so you can see. I'm gonna go ahead and click that run button and you see how the light illuminates on the chip. We get some flashing on the JR programmer and then when it finishes up, boom, we're done. So we just double program the chip, it's totally fine. You can program and reprogram these things all day long. Hey, so uh, we'll go ahead and now put the case or, or the console back into its shell because again, we're done with the underside, we're done soldering. So we'll go ahead and slide that guy right into here and uh, we'll take the last step of writing the ECC file. Uh, we'll set up for that here. All right, so our, our last step that we need in order to um, actually get this console attempting to boot and doing something for us is that we need to write what's called the ECC file, which is what contains Zell, to the NAND of this console. So before, when we had this thing hooked up with the JR programmer, all we did was read the NAND. We took copies of it. So we don't need our programming cable anymore, right? We've already programmed our glitch chip, but we are going to do NAND interaction, read writes. So so we need to move this switch back to the other position. So again, I unplug it, I move that switch back to the left, go ahead and replug it in. And what we're gonna need to do is, once again, supply standby power to the console. And then we can go ahead and plug in our NAND header into our JR programmer. And what we'll do here is um, go back into JRunner and generate and write our ECC file. So now that we've got that, we can just move this out of the way. What we need to do is have selected the appropriate options here. We need to go uh, glitch two, even though technically this is an RGH 1.2, it's based on RGH two images. So glitch two is the correct selection. And there is no need to select the CR4 option. Uh, but what we'll do here is actually just hit create ECC. Uh, it's a Jasper 512, that's what we knew from before. It's gone ahead and created an ECC. If we look at this source field right now, you can see this image 000 ECC file. And then because we've got standby power applied, we've got our JR programmer hooked up, we can go ahead and say write ECC, and it asks for confirmation again. And now it's actually gonna, for the first time, write something to our console. And, and here we go, we, we had our, our first live failure here. Um, it is not wanting to write, so let's look and see what we might have done wrong. I've got standby power provided. I've got the um, port in the correct orientation, I believe. So let me just unplug my JR programmer. I'm gonna make sure that my, oh, you know what? I should show you guys this, hold on. I just unplugged it from the USB. I'm just gonna unplug it here. I'm gonna replug it, make sure it's nice and firm. Because we know this soldering is good. We, we took our reads that way before. And I'm, I'm not contacting anything here. I'm not grounding off. Uh, so let's give it another shot. Let's say I'll write our ECC. Let's see, there we go. So it was just a simple plug issue, a little untry, retry sort of thing. Uh, handled that no problem. And this happens real nice and fast because it only requires 50 blocks to be written. So we don't need any fast forwarding here. We've got Zell now written to the console and uh, we are ready to attempt our boot to obtain our magical CPU key, which is what will allow us to generate our final hacked image here. So what we need to do again is uh, unplug our JR programmer we need to, what I like to do is unplug the power here. And while technically maybe you could do this without the fan, I don't like running these fats as they're prone to R-Rod without uh, a fan in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that back first. So go ahead and connect the fan up, plug that guy in, being a little careful of my D wire that's uh, routed through that corner, put my fan back, and then also put my fan shroud back. Now, as far as connectivity to the back of the console here, I'm gonna do three connections. I'm gonna reconnect my power. I'm gonna throw an HDMI plug in there. And then I'm also, to make it easy on myself, I am going to plug in 
an ethernet cable. And this is going to put it just on my local network that runs back to my router or, or switch. And the reason that I do this is so that I don't have to manually type in the CPU key, but rather I can just capture it across the network and do a copy paste. So we've got the console ready to go. I put the ring of light board back in there so that I can physically press the power button. We've got everything connected. We are ready to try to boot Zell. So here goes. We'll go ahead and press it. And now I changed out the LEDs to red on this board. So it's not defective. It's, it's just intentionally. And you can see we got some flashes. Now we got a boot. And uh, actually what we're going to see on screen here as the console boots is Zell. That's gonna display to us our ever important CPU key. Uh, and that's what we're gonna need. So you can see in this first section where it said success, we got an IP and down here we got this network config. So first option is you can take that CPU key. You could just copy it down, write it, type it, whatever you wanna do, plug that into JRunner. What I'm gonna do is be a little sneaky because I plugged in the ethernet, it has an IP address. What I can do, so that's .140. So I can come up here to uh, a web browser and I can go 192.168. Oh, I'm not showing this to you guys, am I? Um, dot one, and then it was 40. And I have some shortcuts set to those in OBS, which is why it did that. So, okay, I typed in the IP address. I go ahead and press enter. Uh, was it 40 or 140? Let's add a one there without pressing the four. That was 140, okay. So uh, 192.168.140, throw that right in your browser. Look at that, I got my CPU key right on the computer so I don't have to, I can be lazy. I can just right click, copy it, come over to J, uh, JRunner, paste that in. And this is what we wanna see, initializing. Um, and it's understanding what you can also do is look at this NAND info and KV info. Now we can decrypt our DVD key. We can see the console serial number. We've got all sorts of good information about the console that we didn't have before. And now um, on the console, which is still running actually, we can go ahead and power that bad boy off. And uh, we don't need just Zell, right? We want full fledged uh, modified image called an XE build image. That's the, the modded, um, uh, dashboard basically that lets you get away with everything that you want to get away with so I'm gonna unplug my Ethernet I don't want to accidentally try to connect this thing to Xbox Live and I'm gonna go ahead and reconnect my JR programmer my switch is still to the left it's in the right way I'm gonna go ahead and replug that in and then what we need to do for um, JRunner and on the software side is come up here and reselect glitch 2 for whatever reason uh, JRunner automatically tries to pick for you and it picks wrong. So we want glitch two still. We want to say create XE build image. Now, if you get this pop up, be real careful here. Let's let's parse this out. So it says SMC bin found. Delete it? Question mark. So so do you want to delete it? Hmm? And then it, it gives you a piece of advice. Unless you put it there, delete it. And that's good advice. So I didn't intentionally put any file anywhere, right? We haven't talked about that. So it says, SMC found, delete it? Yes, we do want to delete it per its own advice, right? So we'll say yes there, and we'll get this nice little dialogue that'll scroll through a bunch of text. It'll tell us our serial number, our um, console ID, our CPU key, our all sorts of stuff here. We've generated now the UPD flash dot bin. That's our ultimate hacked image that we want to write to the console. So you can see here in the source that's automatically populated to UPD flash bin. And we, what we can do is go ahead and actually just click this write NAND button because again, we're, we're supplying the console standby power. We've got our JR programmer plugged in. We'll say write NAND. We'll say okay to confirm and it should begin the process of writing that final man. Okay, so same story that we had last time. Uh, JR programmers can be a little flaky. So we'll, we'll just repeat the same steps. We'll unplug, we'll unplug, we'll replug, we'll replug here. I think it's actually this cable. I think it's this one. 
being a little outdated or, or old. I've used it a whole bunch of times. We'll go back and we'll say right and and again. Let's see if that fixes this up. Okay, we're still having the same issue, so this is good. I, I, I'd like you guys to see the troubleshooting here, so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to unplug. This time I'm actually going to cut power to the console as a whole. I'm going to re-plug, so I, I removed the power supply. I'm going to press my power button a couple times to just discharge the capacitors. Then I'm going to re-plug my power. I'm going to unplug and re-plug my USB to my JR programmer. I'm going to connect it up again. Again, I'm not going to retouch any soldering. We already know this works. It's just sometimes the equipment can be a little flaky. We'll come up here. We'll say right and and again. Let's see what it wants to do. There we go. Same thing. So just a whole bunch of unplug it and replug it. And uh, we are now successfully writing our final NAND image. Now this is going to take the same 13 minutes to finish that each of our um, first passes of reading did so I will similarly uh, fast forward through this section and we'll be back in uh, just a few minutes with that All right, so slowing things down as we're uh, wrapping up towards the end here, what I want to point out and take just a moment to do is to call out that way up here in the process where we had our uh, error reading those blocks, if you had any bad blocks indicated, you may in the final write that we're performing now have similar blocks indicated. Now as long as those match up with what you had before, and I, I wouldn't even spend the effort to like double check that, but if you see some error writing to block da 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 da, um, that's to be expected especially if you had bad blocks earlier in the process. Now if you see error writing, error writing, error writing and it fills the whole screen, something's wrong, stop, restart your write. But uh, if you see just a couple of blocks that are related to that stuff before, totally normal. So here we go, we just completed our final read, or excuse me, our final write of our updflash.bin. We can go ahead and disconnect our JR programmer. We can disconnect power real quick, uh, just as kind of a precaution, then we reconnect it. And uh, what we'll do here is our uh, kind of final boot that should show the console glitch per the pulse and then actually start up into a stock looking dashboard and I'll, I'll do a quick demonstration on how that it can actually uh, launch XEX menu at that point which is not something that a standard retail console would be able to do so here goes we see the flashing indicating the glitch chip is enabled and we should see a nice uh, LED animation there which we do indicating a successful boot if we switch over to the capture here we should get a uh, stock looking Xbox logo which of course is uh, out of whack here as far as the uh, the size goes let me just reposition that for you so this console actually belongs to a customer so uh, this is Chris's profile on there and that's just what's in the uh, onboard storage here and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in a USB stick which contains a copy of XEX menu. Now it also has the dashboard update on it and I think that might cause us some headache here. Um, so let's see what it does as far as the UPD flash goes. Um, so if we go over to the games tab, that's two right bumpers over. Um, Okay, so we are getting the update required option here. And this is uh, because I also have on this USB stick the dashboard updates. Now I know from experience that if I try to launch XEX menu without doing this, um, that I, I'll run into trouble. So let me um, show you on the PC what exactly it is that, that's on here, what's causing this, 
and we'll actually disable that so that I can show you XEX menu. So normally um, you would potentially want to apply this update, um, but let me let me give you a high level run through because this is going to be relevant for pretty much everybody anyway. So I'm going to power the console off. Uh, we'll go up to the monitor here. I'm going to plug the USB into the, the PC here. I need to switch my monitor input one second. All right, so on the USB that we just loaded, um, I have a whole bunch of stuff and files whatnot here. Uh, but what, what you really care about here is these two folders called system update uh, with varying numbers of dollar signs in front of them. And what this actually is, uh, just to show you, is if you go to uh, xbox.com. So the way that I always get there is Xbox 360 update, right? So you do a Google, you get this support xbox.com. Um, if you click on that link, it will always bring you to the, the newest one. And you say install from a USB flash drive here. That'll jump you down to the page where you can download the update file. So we click on that. We actually start downloading the file system update 17511, which is the current dashboard. That package contains system update folders named without the dollar signs. The reason the dollar signs are there are to get around some of the restrictions that Dash Launch puts in place. So I keep a copy with both names here. But what I'm going to do in order to make it so that the, the console doesn't recognize them is I'm just going to put a dash in front of each name here real quick. And now that they're named differently, the system will not prompt me to do the update uh, while I am trying to demonstrate XEX menu. So I'll go ahead and eject the USB. Uh, we'll say try again. We ejected the USB. Now we can uh, actually pop over here to the uh, camera and we'll, we'll restart the console again. So we see the glitches. We should see the uh, successful animation, which, I mean, man, we're singing, right? We're getting Insta boots every single time. Uh, so if we go over to the uh, capture card, we're gonna boot up as normal. We'll fire up our controller. So we're synced in here. Now I'm going to go ahead and plug in that USB one more time. And again, I've got XEX menu loaded up on this thing. Uh, I'll, I'll try to throw a link to a tutorial, but literally you can YouTube how to load XEX menu on a USB and, and arrive at the same thing. So we'll go ahead and sign in to a profile here. It's going to ask about connecting. We'll just say no. And then again, we'll go over to the games tab. We'll hit my games. We see XDX menu because it's on the USB. We can launch it, therefore proving that we have, in fact, successfully RGH to console. We've got Aurora Dash Freestyle Dash on here. So if I go into Freestyle, I can uh, then drill down to the default.xex. I could launch Freestyle Dashboard, all things that a retail console could not do. So again, um, Download that system update, name it with the two dollar signs and the single dollar sign. That'll allow you to apply the update. I skipped that step just for the sake of time here because I know this video is hella long. Um, then once you have XEX menu, you can use the storage menu to copy it from your USB onto your hard drive. You can use it to launch things like Freestyle Dash, Dash Launch. Uh, maybe I'll do some additional videos. Uh, on, on additional software and stuff, but storage menu, if we had, a, a, or we do actually have enough room on the internal unit here, we could go for that USB under demos is where XEX menu shows up. And we could actually say, copy that. And then if we had a hard drive, we could copy it onto the hard drive. In this case, we could copy it onto the internal storage. I'm not gonna do that because this customer does have a hard drive. I just haven't reconnected it yet. But we are done. This console is RGH 1.2 Insta booting. The only last items that I would do here would be final cleanup. Um, I'm not going to bother showing you here, but we would just desolder the NAND wires. There's no reason that this needs to remain connected. However, if you wanted to leave it connected, you totally could just tuck it under here because that would allow you, in case you ever bricked the console, to rewrite your good UPD flash.bin that you know is valid. Uh, and then reassemble the case, put your DVD drive back together. You are good. This console is RGH 100% set. 
Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did and you want to support me, consider buying your supplies at store.weekendmonitor.com. Thanks again. Peace out.